Meanwhile, Tito's guerrillas were stepping up their activities, at the same time bidding against Mihailovic for British aid. In May 1943, a team of British officers parachuted into Croatia with the aim of contacting Tito and assessing his partisans' capabilities. They reported favourably, and the decision was made to concentrate SOE support on Tito. Their arrival came at an opportune moment, for the Germans had embarked on a campaign of extermination against the partisans, aided by Italian and Bulgarian troops, as well as Chetniks. This was the fifth and most aggressive anti-guerrilla operation, and the British officers found themselves, with Tito's headquarters, as fugitives in the wild Croatian mountain fastnesses. Chased into Montenegro in June, the partisans and their British advisers had to fight their way out of a huge trap, losing 8,000 partisans, men and women, in the process. Winston Churchill, greatly impressed by Tito's performance, appointed Brigadier Fitzroy Maclean, a former diplomat, as his personal representative to the partisan leader. Maclean was duly parachuted into Tito's headquarters, and his subsequent report resulted in a considerable increase in British support. The British Balkan Air Force was now dedicated to supporting the partisans. Apart from hundreds of supply drops, its bow fighter aircraft ranged far and wide to engage German positions and harass their lines of communication. From the island of Vis, Tito went to Moscow for an audience with Stalin. Amongst subjects discussed was the delicate matter of the entry of Soviet forces into Yugoslavia, for which Tito, possibly tongue-in-cheek, granted permission on Stalin's promise, which curiously was kept, that the Soviet forces would be withdrawn as soon as they were no longer required for military purposes. Elements of the Red Army crossed the border from Romania in September 1944. This had an instant effect on the German High Command, as it threatened the withdrawal routes of their Army Group E along the Adriatic coast. The capital, Belgrade, fell to a combined entry of Red Army and Partisans on the 20th of October. Up in the hills of Slavonia, in eastern Croatia, a party of British liaison officers watched developments with interest as winter drew in. Their aim in life was to impede the passage of Army Group E. Captain Morris Sutcliffe of the Royal Irish Fusiliers kept watch on the road and rail links between Belgrade and Zagreb. His instructions were to arrange supply drops and help escaping air crew and former prisoners of war and gather intelligence, identify targets for airstrikes and generally help the partisans. This partisan group had rich pickings on this vital communication route and their saboteur partisans, the Divizante, made the most of it armed with explosive coal, an SOE nasty, which was placed in the railway coal yard stacks. Their elimination became a matter of urgency for the German high command. Sutcliffe had other diversions too. His hideout area was under the path of British and American bombers based in Italy, bound for targets further north in Austria and Romania. A number of these were shot down over Yugoslavia by fighters or ground fire, and those of their crews who bailed out found themselves adding to the strength of partisan groups. Sutcliffe's was augmented in November 1944 by the crew of a Wellington bomber. As he recounted, Guests such as the Wellington crew were ever welcome in our tiny hut in the hills. We gave them some food and a few items of warm clothing and reported to the SOE base in Italy that they were safe. Arranging a pickup was not always easy, since opportunities for night pickups were very limited and we were forever vulnerable to rapid penetration of our area by the Germans. Normally one had some warning, but on this occasion almost none. No time to prepare a rucksack with food, only time to grab our radio crystals and codes and head straight into the higher hills and forests. The Wellington crew had no warm clothing, only battle dress, 
Sutcliffe's group were pretty fit after a long spell in the mountains, but the RAF crew found the going of the next 24 hours pretty exhausting. The partisan commander, a veteran since 1941 when the German army invaded, knew the local hills well, which enabled them to keep a step ahead of their pursuers. Enduring extreme cold and hunger, they eventually reached an old logging camp. Using their suitcase radio, an SOE speciality, Sutcliffe's party were able to contact their headquarters at Bari in southern Italy. And after further adventures, the Wellington crew were picked up off a snow-covered ad hoc airstrip by a Dakota with a fighter escort and flown to safety. These adventures were typical of so many occurring to the young officers and signalers dropped into Yugoslavia during its occupation by the Germans. By the end of October 1944, most of Hungary was in Russian hands. The hapless Horthy was a captive of the Germans, and at the end of the year, Budapest was under siege. The German garrison was under Hitler's orders to fight to the end, for its early capture would allow the Russians to pour across the Hungarian plain and on into Vienna. Tolbukhin's third Ukrainian front had already bypassed Budapest and was heading for Vienna, but its flanks were imperiled and on orders from Moscow, he turned back to deal with the resolute defenders of the Hungarian capital. Such was the German High Command's appreciation of the crisis that they had heavily reinforced the Hungarian front. Army Group South, though battered, still had plenty of fight left and counter-attacked against Malinovsky's second Ukrainian front as it started its attack on Budapest in mid-October 1944. The Russians were temporarily halted, and when their attack resumed at the end of the month, they found themselves confronted by 12 German divisions. Their advance towards the city centre was contested every inch of the way, and in mid-November they had still not taken the city, now largely in ruins. The defenders were, however, now isolated, as the main German front line, along the River Drava, had recoiled over a hundred miles to the west, with one flank on the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains and the other anchored on Lake Balaton. The siege of Budapest continued into the new year. Its defenders continued to resist fiercely and held out until mid-February 1945. The line of the Carpathian Mountains divided the main Russian front in two sectors and effectively created two separate campaigns. To the south, the battle for the remainder of Hungary, while to the north, the Red Army headed purposefully for Berlin. As in Yugoslavia, SOE had sent British liaison officers into Greece early in the German occupation. Indeed, some British soldiers, cut off from their units in the retreat of 1941, spent the entire war among the Greek and Cretan partisans. The liaison officers had to be prepared for almost anything once they were parachuted into occupied Greece. All were aware of the Hitler directive ordering the execution of any Allied personnel caught whilst working with guerrillas. And many found that the internal political divisions in occupied Greece could result in their being betrayed at any moment. Typical of them was a 35-year-old Cambridge Classics Don, Nicholas Hammond. Before the war, as a fellow of Clare College, he would visited Greece many times to explore archaeological sites and knew the country intimately, as well as being fluent in modern as well as classical Greek. Hammond's linguistic skills, as well as his knowledge of Greece and Albania, were duly recognised, and after what he described as minimal training in the use of explosives, he was sent to Athens in midsummer 1940 with the aim of raising a rebellion against the Italians in Albania. The Greek authorities promptly expelled him, and he went on to Palestine, where he trained a motley band of Greek dissidents, mostly communists, in the arts of demolition and sabotage. In October 1940, Mussolini's ultimatum to Greece led to invasion, and Hammond returned to Greece and continued to train Greek recruits. The arrival of the Germans early in April 1941 in support of the flagging Italian invasion turned the scales decisively. The Greek army was outflanked and laid down its arms two weeks later. 
When the British and Empire forces were forced from the mainland, then Crete.